Income Tax 2023-2024, American Opportunity Credit, What Expenses Qualify, Part Number 2. Get ready and some coffee, because although the best things in life are free, you know eventually the government will find some way to tax them. Like when I was at the beach the other day and went into the water, I'm pretty sure the government hired the seagulls to steal my lunch. Most of this information... First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like this CPA thinking cap, for example. CPA thinking CAP, you see what we did with like with the letters? And... This CPA thinking cap is not just for CPAs either. Anyone can and should have at least one, possibly multiple CPA thinking caps. Why? Because based on our scientific survey of five people, all of whom directly profit from the sale of these CPA thinking caps, wearing this CPA thinking cap without a doubt, according to the survey, increases accounting productivity tenfold. Yeah, at least. Yeah, apparently the hat actually channels like accounting energy from the quantum field ether directly into your head, allowing you to navigate spreadsheets faster. It's kind of like how in like the Matrix when Neo learns Kung Fu, or at least that's what the scientific survey's saying. So get one, because the scientific survey participants could really use some extra cash. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. You can be found in publication 970 tax benefits for education tax year 2023, which you can find on the IRS website at irs.gov, irs.gov. We're at the bottom part of the income tax formula where the credits live. Remember in the first half of the income tax formula, basically a funny income statement ending at taxable income. Taxable income therefore being similar to net income, basically the bottom line of the income statement part of the income tax formula, but that's only half the story, half the formula. We've got the second half taking the taxable income, applying the tax rate to it. That not being a flat tax rate, mind you, but a progressive tax system calculation to get to the tax before credits and other taxes. Then we have to, of course, apply the credits and other taxes, other taxes, including things such as the self-employment tax. If we have a sole proprietorship Schedule C business, Credits, our point of focus here, like deductions are good. However, if we had a dollar of a deduction, it would simply be decreasing the taxable income on the incomes part of the income tax formula. The benefit we get only being part of that dollar because it would be multiplied times the tax rate, which would be dependent on the tax bracket that we are in. Whereas if we got a dollar of a credit, we might get the full benefit of that dollar credit if for example we had the liability in order to consume it for the credits up here which are what we call the non-refundable credits those that can't take the tax liability below zero that gets us to the to the total tax then we apply the payments including withholdings and estimated tax payments and then we have the refundable credits which can take the tax liability below zero in which case they are acting not as a tax but using the tax code to have a welfare or benefit or safety net type of program that finally gets us to the tax refund or tax due so we're looking at the education uh credits and therefore usually we're going to have to get a 1098t from a qualified institution to claim the credits, noting that generally for income tax purposes, you would think that we have an income statement format. We're taking the net income and applying the taxes to the net income. Those deductions that seem fair for an income tax would be those things we needed to consume in order to generate the revenue, which is most clearly and directly seen on like a Schedule C situation where the expenses or deductions are those things that were ordinary and necessary to generate the revenue. With education expenses, remember it's a little bit different
because the IRS is kind of incentivizing us to do something that they think is beneficial by giving us these like tax treats and whatnot in order to do that. So they're basically nudging us. The argument for doing that is that it's worth our tax dollars to subsidize the uh, schools and whatnot, which is basically what is happening because of the positive externalities from an economic standpoint of people getting educations who then go to work and make stuff. And from an economic standpoint, a good education does have those positive externalities and are good. The, on the bad side of that, of course, the, when we subsidize anything, the price of that thing goes up, they become isolated from an actual competitive market and the thing gets worse in quality. That's just the trade-off that ends up happening. So that means that if we get a benefit of a, 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 a credit, if the institution is going to then the institution is going to be pressured then to give this information on the irs's behalf meaning given the 1098 t not a 1099 which is typically thinking about income that we might have to report but the 1098 t being similar to the 1098 for interest that might be issued by a financial institution such as a bank the IRS can pressure the financial or the educational institutions and financial institutions to issue these 1098s because th these institutions ha are intertwined in some way with the government in the case of education, that being because even if you're not a public school, you're gonna get a lot of funding through the students who are getting student loans. And that's so that's where the IRS has the leverage. Now, remember when we apply the credit, it's usually the ordering of, we want the biggest credit, which would be the American Opportunity Credit, then the Lifetime Learning Credit, if we can't get the American Opportunity, and then we we'll, might go for uh, deductions. This is the second page of uh, our worksheet for the credit on the tax form, part two for the refundable American Opportunity Credit. And this is page two of the form 1040, where we have the uh, tax and credits section and then the payments section down below now we're going to be continuing on with our discussion that we started last time now thinking about a situation of a refund so in other words what would happen if we basically got the credit we took a deduction for it and then they basically refunded the, the the money we got a refund for the expenses that we used in order to calculate the credit so the credit like a deduction is basically good so we got a tax benefit for expenses that we incurred and not as a deduction but we calculated them as a credit and then we got the money back in a refund so it's kind of like well we didn't actually pay the money and therefore what do i have to do i think i have to fix the return do i have to go back to the prior year and fix the return because that's kind of a pain or can i fix it in the current year so i don't have to go back and amend the prior year this is similar to a situation that many people see with the sale with the state income tax for example where if you're in a state like california you have to pay state income taxes similar to the federal income taxes and for some reason, the state income taxes might be deductible on the federal income taxes as an itemized deduction if uh, you are able to take the itemized deductions. But like with the federal taxes, we will typically overpay the state taxes and therefore get a refund in the following year. So if you give me a deduction for the amount of taxes that I pay to the state in the current year, I'm going to get an over deduction because in the following year, the state's going to give me some of that money back. So what do I do? I have to amend the return in the following year if I got a deduction in the current, in, you know, in that year for the expense, or can I take care of it in the current year? With the regards to the state taxes, usually the idea would be, well, if you itemized, if you got a deduction, the refund you get from the state, instead of going back and reducing your deduction in the prior year, we will allow you to record as income in the current year. Similarly here, you would think you have a similar situation, except it's a little bit more complicated because now you didn't take a deduction that you could just record possibly as income, but you actually got a credit, which is a little bit more cumbersome of a calculation, right? All right, so refunds. Now notice that the refunds don't happen all the time 
as they are expected to happen on the state taxes, for example, generally. Okay, a refund of qualified education expenses may reduce adjusted qualified education expenses for the tax year or required payment re uh, recapture of the credit claimed in an earlier year. So some tax-free educational assistance received after 2023 may be treated as a refund. You can see tax-free educational assistance earlier. Refunds received in 2023. All right, so here we go. For each student, figure the adjusted qualified education expenses for 2023 by adding all the qualified education expenses for 2023 and subtracting any refunds of those expenses received from the, the eligible educational institutions during 2023. So in other words, you've got your, your 1098T. That's obviously going to be the, the, the amount of the tuition, which could or may include like books and whatnot, but you might also have to pay for books and whatnot. So what you report on the tax return might not exactly match what's on uh, the 1098T, for example. But here we're looking at this refund situation. What if you paid money to the school in 2023 and then maybe you dropped a class or something like that and you did it before the point in time where they're actually going to refund the money to you? I mean, you dropped it pretty early, right? Even before they kicked you into the, on, into the online Zoom classroom, right? So if that happened in 2023, then once they refund the money to you, then of course you can take that into consideration when you when you do your tax uh, calculation. So you could reduce the amount that you paid by the amount that was refunded to you, which might be reflected on the 1098T. So you wanna make sure if that how that's being reflected on the 1098T. So because it all happened in the same year, you should be able to take care of it. Refunds received after 2023, but before your income tax return is filed. So if anyone received a refund after 2023 of qualified education expenses paid on behalf of a student in 2023, and the refund is paid before you file an income tax return for 2023, the amount of qualified education expenses for 2023 is reduced by the amount of the refund. So in other words, you paid the, the tuition and whatnot in 2023, you got a refund, the refund didn't happen until 2024, so you have this cutoff problem, but you haven't yet filed the taxes for year 2023 because you're not gonna do that until like April 15th of 2024 or possibly later if you have an extension. And if you know about the refund in 2024, the easiest thing to do is to fix the 2023 return before you file it right that would be the easiest thing to do so you would think that would be the solution in that case because you don't have to amend 2023 even though you got the refund in 2024 because you knew about the refund before you file the 2023 return okay but what if refund received after 2023 and after your income tax return is filed so here's where it gets crazy so now here's where you gotta so now what am i gonna do well i already filed the the 2023 return and then i got a refund in 2024 i didn't know about and i got the refund for it now so now do i have to go back and amend the 2023 return which is kind of a pain or can i take care of it in the tax year 2024 so if anyone receives a refund after 2023 of qualified education expenses paid on behalf of a student in 2023 and the refund is paid after you file an income tax return for 2023 you may need to repay some or all of the credit that's going to so now you have a, a recapture situation now notice again this is similar to what we see with the state income taxes you got the state income taxes you've got a refund do i have to what do i have to do with it amend the prior year tax return well no hopefully not well what do i have to what, what can i do well you can record it in income in that situation and that works out easier because because you got a deduction last time so we can kind of match that out by recording it income this time but now you got this credit calculation which isn't a deduction but a credit so that's going to make it more complicated to try to fix it in the current year right that's why you've got this recapture situation all right so credit recapture then how does that work so if any tax-free educational assistance for the qualified education expenses paid in 2023 or any refund of your qualified education expenses paid in 2023 is received after you file your 2023 income tax return, you must recapture, repay any excess credit. 
Now, note, by the way, you might be saying, well, wouldn't the easiest thing to do be to like reduce the education uh, expenses in, in the current year that you're going to be charging for the credit? And it's, it, but there's a problem with that, right? You can't make that as a general rule all the time because you might not be claiming the credit in the current year. You might have claimed the credit last year and you dropped out. That's why you got the refund in the current year. You're no longer going to school. You're not going to be claiming the credit in the current year. So it's not like you could just reduce the, the amount of expenses you claim you know, in the current year because you can't match it out, right? We don't have that easy matching out system as, uh, it, it, as if, it, if it was continual or a system where we can say, well, I'll record it as income because I got a deduction because we got a credit and not a deduction. So you do this by refiguring the amount of your adjusted qualified education expenses for 2023 by reducing the expenses by the amount of the refund or tax-free education assistance. So now we have to basically recalculate our prior year tax return, not so that we can amend it, but we're basically doing the same work as though we were going to amend it to figure out what the tax difference would be if I reduced the amount of education expenses to the amount by the amount of refund I got. You then figure your education credits for 2023 and figure the amount by which your 2023 tax liability would have increased if you claimed the refigured credits. Include that amount as additional tax for the year the refund or tax-free assistance was received. So the, if we compare this to our analogy of the state income tax refund, with the state income tax refund, we could just say, okay, I got a deduction last year. I got a tax benefit for it. So I'm just going to assume I'm in like the same tax brackets and whatnot and record it as income this year, which should in theory give me a similar approximation of the tax benefits because it's a deduction versus an income. Although that's very simplified because you can imagine situations where the tax brackets are quite different because of different income levels and so on and so forth. But here we can't really do that. So we have to say, okay, well, if I got a deduction for it last year, I've got to go back into the last, last year's tax software, possibly recalculate my taxes kind of as though I was going to do an amended tax return, but instead of going through the pain, and it is kind of a pain to actually process an amended tax return, I can include that as an additional tax liability on the current tax return rather than as on, on the income statement side of things. I have to include it on the second page out of the tax adjustment. All right, example. Let's see how this thing works in practice. You paid $7,000 tuition and fees in August 2023, and your child began college in September 2023. You filed your 2023 tax return on February 17, 2024, and claimed an American Opportunity Credit of $2,500. After you filed your return, you received a refund of $4,000 because the kid dropped out. Kid went over there, started partying and whatnot, and he didn't go to school. He just wasted, basically wasted my money. But at least, at least we got a refund. It's, it's ridiculous. Anyway, whatever. Just kidding. I don't have it. But you must refigure your 2023 American Opportunity Credit using $3,000 of qualified education expenses instead of $7,000. The, the refigured credit is 2250 The increase to your tax liability is $250. So once again, you must refigure your 2023. So 2023 is already done, but I'm going to go back to that software and basically refigure it after taking into consideration this refund. So the American Opportunity Credit using 3000 of education expenses instead of 7000 why why the 3000 because he said here we paid 7000 and then uh, you received a refund of 4000 the difference being the 3000 so we recalculate 2023 based on the 3000 instead of the 7000 based on doing that calculation the refigured credit is only 2250 instead of 2500 dollars so there's, there would be an increase to your tax liability for that change in the prior year of $250. So now we're just going to include the difference of $250 as additional tax on your 2024 return. Now notice you basically did the whole process of 
an amended tax return. That's kind of what you do when you do an amended tax return. So you could think, well, I could just file the amended tax return, but still filing an amended tax return, a 1040X is a pain. So it is a lot easier to then say, okay, I've just figured the difference of what the tax would have been in 2023. Instead of filing an amended tax return, I'm just gonna include that tax, uh, the difference of 250 as additional tax on my 2024 tax return. That's the easy thing to do. So see the instructions for your 2024 income tax return to determine uh, where to include this tax. Tip, if you pay qualified education expenses in both 2023 and 2024 for an academic period that begins in the first three months of 2024 and you receive tax-free educational assistance or a refund as described above, you may choose to reduce your qualified education expenses for 2024 instead of reducing your expenses for, for 2023. So now you have the situation that might have popped up in your mind as why isn't that the solution? Meaning, look, if, if, I, if I got a refund in 2023, then in 2024, why don't I just reduce the education expenses by, by the amount of refund in 2024? That would be the easy thing to do. But th that can't be the general rule because you might not have any educate. You might not have had anybody go to school in 2024. But if they did go to school in 2024, then maybe that would be the easy thing to do. You could just say, well, here's my 2024 amounts that I'm using to calculate the American Opportunity Credit once again in 2024, and I'm gonna reduce it by the refund that I got from 2023, which I've already, so, so then you might be able to take care of it that way. All right, so amounts that don't reduce qualified education expenses, don't reduce qualified education expenses by amounts paid with funds the student received as payments for services such as uh, wages. So a loan. So in other words, so now you've got these qualified education expenses we talked about, they might need to be reduced possibly for things like scholarships or whatnot because they got a tax benefit from them. However, payments for services such as wages, then then obviously you're not gonna, re if you paid for education expenses like tuition and whatnot, it's not like you paid for it with free money even though your employer might have basically helped you to actually pay the institution or it came out of your paycheck because because you're you're including the wages and income so if you included the wages and income then you would think you'd get the deduction or credit calculation a loan similar we all we've already talked about this loan situation people get confused with loans and i think what people say about their home loan is part of that confusion when people say something like the bank owns 80 percent of my home that's started out i think that started out originally to be an an overstatement right I don't really own the home. I'm not rich or anything. The bank owns 80% of the home. That's not exactly right because remember the bank can't come to the kitchen table and tell you what color to paint the bathroom. They don't own the home. They only have the home as collateral if you default on the loan. There's a big, it's actually a big difference, right? Similarly with the education situation, you got a loan, you use the money to pay for, for education. So it's not like the government paid for the education. You still get to claim the expenses as an expense or a credit because you're gonna have to pay back the loan, not only that, but pay for the loan in terms of interest unless you know the government waives them or something at some future time and good luck with that. But please don't vote based on that, them bribing you like that. It's just, it's, that's not the way to do it. But anyway, so a gift. We have a, a gift situation. So so, we, so if it was a gift, we're not going to reduce for a gift situation and inheritance situation. So both of these are kind of linked in nature because it could be a gift or an inheritance. So if, a, if an uncle or something gave you money to go to uh, the financial institution, it's not exactly the same thing as a grant situation where you're getting money from like the taxpayer or you know some organization or possibly you know if you, if you got money from a from a an, the government or something like that in this case you have a gift and so you're not typically going to be reduce the expenses 
on how you're going to be using the gift that you re received. So a withdrawal from the student's personal savings. So if it was obviously money that came out of your personal savings account, then you paid for it, right? So you're not going to be so <laughs> You, there's no reason that you would reduce the amount of benefit that you might get to claim that as, you know, an expense, an education expense deduction or towards the credit. So don't reduce the qualified education expenses by any scholarship or fellowship grant reported as income on the student's tax return in the following situations. So remember, if you got a scholarship or fellowship grant, now you're getting money from other organizations that that possibly already give you a tax benefit that's why you might not be able to double dip also getting the benefit of how you use that money in the form of like credits or deductions so the use of money is restricted by the terms of the scholarship or fellowship grant to costs of attendance such as room and board other than qualified education expenses as defined in qualified education expenses in chapter one so we've seen that there's room and board situations a little bit that's kind of like often kind of the confusing situation because when we're trying to figure the expenses that qualify we know that the tuition itself is going to qualify and then the supplies and whatnot room and board possibly not but room and board could be things that might be included in like the grant money or or the uh the the fellowship grant or scholarship money so the use of the money isn't restricted so this might be a little bit of an unusual situation but let me just see if i can break this down a little bit more obviously if you're getting money from a scholarship or fellowship grant if it came through on the W-2 as wages or something like that, it might not be included in box one. So you already got a benefit f from it. And then if you, d if you didn't get it through a, the employer, the W-2, then you might have to, if it was tax-free money, reduce the amount of the expenses that you paid on these items. Now, if the use of that money, uh, money isn't restricted, then you would think it would be included in income. It would be something that basically you'd have to include in income. And if you included it in income, you would think that if you spent it on qualified education expenses, then you would be able to take those as expenses as calculating towards uh, your deduction. And this one, the use of the money is restricted. Now, if it's restricted, then you would think the reason it's restricted is so that they can give you possibly a tax benefit not including in, in income would be the general r reason to restrict it as opposed to having uh, the money used for whatever you want it to be by terms of the scholarship to cost of attendance such as room and board other than qualified education expenses so in other words when you calculate the qualified education expenses it's not going to be including room and board so so you're not going to be reducing the amount of money that you received for room and board to the to the education expenses that weren't used for room and board because that's not part of the calculation for the room and board i think is what they're trying to get at there but in any case example let's take a look at an example joanne paid three thousand dollars for tuition and five thousand dollars for room and board in university x the university did not require payment of any fees in addition to the tuition in order to enroll in or attend classes to help pay for these costs joanne was awarded a two thousand dollar scholarship and a four thousand dollar student loan the terms of the scholarship state that it can be used to pay uh, any of joanne's college expenses Okay, so University X applies the $2,000 scholarship against Joanne's $8,000 total bill and Joanne pays $6,000 balance of the bill from University X with a combination of the student loan and personal savings. So Joanne doesn't report any portion of the scholarship as income on the tax return, which I think is going to be generally the case. So now she got kind of like the free income from uh, the scholarship. So in figuring the amount of either education credit, American opportunity, or the lifetime learning, Joanne must reduce the qualified education expenses by the amount of the scholarship, $2,000, 
because the entire scholarship was excluded from the reportable income on Joanne's tax return. So the student loan isn't tax-free educational assistance, so the qualified expenses don't need to be reduced by any part of the loan proceeds. Joanne is treated as having paid $1,000 in qualified education expenses, so the tuition was the $3,000 minus the scholarship, and we didn't have to reduce it by the loan amount. So notice up here we have Joanne paid $3,000 in tuition, that of course is going to count towards our our calculation and it's usually going to be on the 1098t you would expect and five thousand for room and board the room and board typically is not something that's going to qualify for the expenses and that's what often kind of gets confusing the room and board oftentimes might not be included in the 1098t but could be included in some of these scholarship kind of situations which kind of muddies the water in terms of how much you might have to adjust the 3000 tuition or or the the expenses based on like scholarships right so the university did not receive payments of any fees in addition to the tuition uh in order to enroll and attend the classes so we're not going to get into books and supplies and whatnot to help pay these costs joanne was awarded a two thousand dollar scholarship so we took the three thousand reduced it by the two thousand and a four thousand student loan so notice that that student loan was used to pay for for the part of the tuition possibly but also for like this room and board situation right but but it doesn't really matter because the loan that was taken out is going to have to be paid back uh with interest and the loan is not something that will typically be reducing the amount that would be the qualified expenses for education expenses which don't include the room and board okay example two so the facts are the same as in example one except that joanne reports the entire scholarship as income so now she had to include it, the scholarship as income which means that now you would think that she might be able to get a benefit or, or not reduce her expenses because she included it as income. So because Joanne reported the entire 2000 scholarship as income, the qualified education expenses don't need to be reduced. Joanne is treated as having paid 3000. So remember she paid 3000 plus 5000 room and board. So we're saying the 3000 are the only qualified uh, expenses because she had to include the 2000 in income. She didn't already get a tax benefit from it then she doesn't have to reduce the amount of 3000 which is probably what would be on the 1098t so it'd be pretty straightforward in that perspective she doesn't have to reduce that amount coordination with pell grants and other scholarships so you may be able to increase your american opportunity credit when the student you your spouse or your dependent includes certain scholarships or fellowship grants in the student's gross income your credit may increase only if the amount of students qualified education expenses minus the total amount of scholarship and fellowship grants is less than four thousand dollars so in other words, one of the benefits we typically have from the Pell Grants and scholarships is that we don't have to include them in income, which when thinking about an income tax system is typically good because for income taxes, income is bad. And we can think of that kind of as equivalent to a situation where they make us record it as income, but then we get a deduction for it. So it's kind of like we'd have to include it in income and then we get the benefit of the deduction taking it out of the taxable income the bottom line the net income however uh, if we were able to get the credit for it instead of in essence the deduction the credit sometimes would be larger than the deduction so that's where we have this kind of funny situation where we might say hey look i would like to basically uh record it in income possibly if it would allow me to get the credit okay so if this situation applies consider including some or all of the scholarship or fellowship grant in the student's income in order to treat the included amount as paying non-qualified expenses instead of qualified education expenses so now we're going to say okay we've got this grant and typically we we're going to say that we applied it to to non-qualified education expenses which still qualify for the proper use of the grant money, but it forces us possibly to say we can include it in income then, which actually could in some cases increase the amount of our 
tax refund or our tax benefit because we basically are getting a credit calculation instead of a deduction calculation. So non-refundable expenses are expenses such as room and board that aren't qualified education expenses such as tuition and related fees. So scholarship and uh, fellowship grants that the student includes in income don't reduce the student's qualified education expenses available to figure your American Opportunity credit, thus including enough scholarship and fellowship grant in the student's income to report up to $4,000 in qualified education expenses for your American Opportunity credit may increase the amount uh, by enough to increase your tax refund or reduce the amount of tax you owe, even considering any increased tax liability from the additional income. So additional income, typically bad, it's gonna increase the calculation of your taxes, but you're now getting uh, a credit, which might more offset the, the benefits. So somewhat of an unusual situation, notice the income, the, the payment is only 4,000, which is kind of you know somewhat low if you went to school like at one of these large institutions for the entire year, for example. In any case, however, the increase to tax liability as well as the loss of other tax credits may be greater than the additional American Opportunity Credit and may cause your tax refund to decrease or the amount of tax you owe to increase. Your specific circumstances will determine what amount, if any, of the scholarship or fellowship grant to include in income to maximize your tax refund or minimize the tax you owe. So probably somewhat of an unusual situation uh, usually when you get this money, you would think we don't want to include it in income if we're not required to. That's the general rule. And we have to then take into consideration possibly reducing the qualified uh, expenses for it. But if you've got the expenses that are less than $4,000 and some of that money might have been spent on something other than qualified education expenses like room and board, you might want to play with that uh, situation and check it out with the tax software. So the scholarship or fellowship grant must be one that may qualify as a tax-free scholarship under the rules discussed in chapter one. Also, the scholarship or fellowship grant must be one that may, by its terms, be used for non-qualified expenses, meaning typically you got the grant money and so on, and usually they force you to pay it into certain things, but the room and board part of it isn't part of the qualified uh, ex expenses for calculating for the credit, and therefore you have some leeway possibly to say what you spent the money on, right? Finally, the amount of the scholarship or fellowship grant that is applied to non-qualified expenses can't exclude the amount of the student's actual non-qualified expenses that are paid in the year. So this amount may differ from the student's living expenses established by the student's school in figuring the official cost of attendance under the student aid rules. The fact that the education Noel Institution applies the scholarship or fellowship grant to qualified education expenses such as tuition and related fees doesn't prevent the student from choosing to apply certain scholarship or fellowship grants to student uh, um, actual non-qualified expenses. So they're just kind of playing with how did you spend the fungible, somewhat fungible money and based, and based on the rules on what you determined to spend it on you might be able to treat it differently for taxes. The question then being, well, what if the school said I spent it differently in their order of operations? And they're trying to say that you might be able to do something different than what the school says in certain situations. So by making this choice, that is by including the part of the scholarship or fellowship grant applied to the student's non-qualified expenses in income, the student may increase taxable income and may be required to file a tax return. So, but this allows payments made in cash, by check, by credit, or debit card, uh, or with borrowed funds, such as student loan, to be applied to the qualified education expenses. All right, let's look at some examples. This is getting crazy, man. Example one, no scholarship. So Bill, age 28 and unmarried, enrolled full-time in 2023 as a first-year student at a local college to earn a degree in law enforcement. So this was Bill, well, watch out in that career these days, man. Good luck, good luck to you, Bill. We're, we're praying for you. So this was Bill's first year of post-secondary education. So during 2023, Bill paid $5,600 for qualified education expenses and $4,400 for room and board 
for the fall 2023 semester. Bill and the, college, and the college meet all the requirements for the American Opportunity Credit. Bill's adjusted gross income, the AGI and MAGI, modified adjusted gross income, for purposes of figuring the credit are $37,350. So Bill claims the standard deduction of $13,850 resulting in taxable income of $23,500 and an income tax liability before credits of $2,603. Bill claims no credit other than the American Opportunity Credit. Bill figures the American Opportunity Credit based on uh, qualified education expenses of $4,000 which results in a credit of 2,500. So notice that $4,000 maximized the credit uh, of the 2,500 and a tax liability after credits of uh, $103. All right, let's switch things up. Scott, let's example number two, scholarship included from income this time. Uh, scholarship excluded from income. So the facts are the same as in example one, no scholarship except that Bill was awarded a 5,600 scholarship. So now we have the scholarship in play. So under the terms of the scholarship, it may be used to pay any educational expenses, including room and board. So that's where it gives us our leeway. So the scholarship, if it's not included in income, and we say that we use the scholarships to pay for the qualified to expenses, you would think that you would have to reduce the qualified expenses uh, by the amount that you that you got the scholarship for. But if we say that we're applying it to the room and board that aren't part of the qualified expenses, then maybe we don't have to reduce the amount that we have the credit calculation for, but we might have to include that part in income. So we have this trade-off of having to have the, you know, it's kind of like, we're trading off the credit for the deduction, right? So if Bill excludes the scholarship from income, it will be deemed for purposes of figuring the education credit to have been played for tuition re uh, required fees and course materials. So if it's excluded from income, we're gonna assume that you paid it not to the room and board, but to like the tuition and whatnot. So Bill's adjusted education expenses would be zero. So it wiped out his education and there would be no uh, education credit because now all of the education credit we're saying was basically paid off by the tax-free money, which means he already basically got a deduction for it in essence because he didn't have to include it in income and therefore you can't double dip and also calculate a credit. But you might say, hey, look, the credit might be worth more than the deduction, you know, in certain cases. So therefore, Bill's tax liability after the credit would be 2,603 versus before when we, when we had uh, liability of 103, right? So it's like, dude, the scholarship worked against me, man. So example number three, scholarship partially included in income. All right, so now we're gonna get into the weeds of this thing. We're gonna say the facts are the same as in example two, scholarship excluded from income. If unlike example two, Bill includes $4,000 of the scholarship in income. So now why does he wanna take 4,000? Because 4,000 is the amount that would maximize the amount of the credit back up to the 2,500. The $4,000 that he includes in income, he's gonna now have to pay income taxes on, which he didn't before, but he's kind of trading the deduction, you know, of not having to include it in income, which is similar to including in income and then getting a deduction for it. He's trading that off for the credit, which might be a higher calculation up to the amount of that 4,000, right? So it includes 4,000 of the scholarship in income. The 4,000 will be deemed to have been applied to pay for room and board. So the remaining 1,600 of the 5,600 scholarship would reduce the qualified education expenses and the adjusted qualified education expenses would uh, be $4,000. So Bill's AGI and modified adjusted gross income would increase. So now he had an increase in income 41,350, which could have an impact on the phase outs, but doesn't in this case because he's below that threshold. And of course, he's gonna have to pay more taxes on the higher income, but it might be more than offset by the credit. So the taxable income would increase to 27,500 and the tax liability before credits would increase to 3,083. 
So based on the adjusted qualified education expenses of $4,000, Bill would be able to claim an American Opportunity Credit of $2,500. So he maxed it out by including the least amount in income that he could to max out the credit at $2,500. And the tax liability after credits would be uh, $5,538. So there we have it. So example four, scholarship applied by the post-secondary school to tuition. So the facts are the same as in example three, scholarship partially included in income, except 5,600 scholarship is paid directly to the local college. So now it's like, well, it went to the local college. So the fact that the local college applies the scholarship to Bill's tuition and related fees doesn't prevent Bill from including 4,000 of the scholarship in income. So you might be, so you might think, hey, well, this doesn't exactly work because you can't just say the scholarship money went to room and board or to the scholarship if the scholarship was paid directly to the institution who then of course applied it to the tuition, not to the room and board. We can see the money trail there, but we're still gonna imagine it's kind of fungible because he could have spent the money on room and board or the scholarship of the tuitions, even though we can see the actual money went to the scholarship and the tuition. So the fact that the local college applies the scholarship to Bill's tuition and related fees doesn't prevent Bill from including $4,000 uh, of scholarship in income. So in as in example three, by doing so, Bill will be deemed to have applied $4,000 to pay for room and board. Bill would be able to claim the American Opportunity Credit of $2,500. He's gonna need a dang fine education before he can figure this out i'll tell you that so example number five student with a dependent child so jane age 28 unmarried uh enrolled full-time as a first year student at a local technical college to get a certificate as a computer technician this was jane's first year of post-secondary education during 2023 jane paid six thousand dollars for qualified educational expenses. Jane and the college meet all the requirements for the American Opportunity Credit. So Jane has a dependent child, age 10, who is a qualified child for purposes of receiving the earned income credit. Oh, here we go with the earned income credit. What's the issue with the earned income credit? And it actually goes up as your income goes up to some degree. So if you can include things in income, once again, it might be beneficial in some cases, even though it's usually not beneficial, not in this case, because we have the comparison of income versus a, a, a credit or deduction versus a credit, but because we're thinking about the American Opportunity Credit, typically a credit for low income uh, individuals, which is often gonna be the case if you're a single mother spending a bunch of time going to school, right? So we got the earned income credit and the child tax credit. So Jane's wages are $21,400. Jane withheld no income taxes on these wages and has no other income or adjustments. So Jane was awarded $5,500 scholarship. So under the terms of the scholarship, it may be used to pay tuition and any living expenses, including rent. So they got the, she got the scholarship. She doesn't have to pay just the, the fees of the school, but could apply to the room and board, uh, which means that, that she has some leeway as to what to include it in income or not. So Jane paid $10,000 in living expenses in 2023. So Jane, if Jane excludes the entire scholarship from income, Jane will be deemed as have applied the entire scholarship to pay for qualified education expenses. The AGI and MAGI, Modified Adjusted Gross Income, would be 21,400. The tax liability before any credits would be $61. The qualified education expenses would be reduced to $500. Jane would be able to receive a 261 American Opportunity Credit. That's $200 refund and 61 non-refundable. Uh, because now we have to break it out between bec the refundable and non-refundable portion, given the fact that we're on the low income side of the spectrum, which greatly complicates things. A 1,600 additional child tax credit. So now we're taking into consideration the child tax credit and 
the 3995 earned income credit for people with low income situation. So in total, Jane would be able to receive tax refund, which isn't really a refund in this case, welfare benefit safety net program, $5,795. So if Jane includes the entire scholarship and in income, Jane will be deemed to have applied the entire scholarship to pay living expenses. So now Jane has two incentives to include an in income. Now she's saying, hey, if I included an in income, it might number one, give me a higher calculation for the education credit versus, versus a deduction as income. And it could possibly increase my earned income tax credit because increase in income sometimes increases that one as well. So the qualified education expenses would be $6,000 and AGI and modified AGI would be $26,900. The tax liability uh, before any credits would be $613. Jane would be able to receive 1,613 American Opportunity Credit. That's 1,000 uh, refundable and 613 non-refundable. A 1,600 additional child tax credit the refundable part of the child tax credit and 3,138 earned income credit. So in total, Jane would be able to receive a tax refund of 5,738. So if Jane includes $3,500 of the scholarship in income, Jane will be deemed to have applied 3,500 of the scholarship to pay living expenses and 2,000 to pay qualified education expenses. The qualified education expenses would be 4,000. So now we're maxing out the credit because we're, we're taking that 4,000 and the AGI modified AGI would be 24,900. The tax liability before credits would be $413. So Jane would be able to receive 1,413 American Opportunity Credit. That's the 1,000 refundable, 413 non-refundable, a 1,600 additional child tax credit, the refundable part of the child tax credit, and a 3,457 earned income credit. In addition, Jane would be able to receive uh, a tax refund of $6,057, which again, isn't really a refund, but kind of like a safety net benefit. So if Jane includes $1,500 of scholarship income, Jane will be deemed to have applied $1,500 of scholarship to pay living expenses and $4,000 to pay qualified education expenses. The qualified education expenses would be $2,000 and the AGI or modified AGI would be $22,900. The tax liability before any credits would be $211. Jane would be able to receive $1,000 111 American Opportunity Credit, 800 refundable, 211 non-refundable, a 1,600 additional child tax credit, and 3,777 earned income credit. In total, Jane would be able to receive a refund of 6,177. This is the highest tax refund among these scenarios. So notice the interplay between the earned income tax credit the refundable and non-refundable part of the child tax credit and additional child tax credit, which is the refundable part, and then the refundable and non-refundable parts of the American Opportunity Credit and how you can kind of mess with those numbers <laughs> based on whether you include some things in income, in this case, the money that comes from the scholarships, for example, gets really confusing. Again, you're gonna need a dang fine edge. You're gonna need a master's degree to figure that out, but but, but you, if you have tax software, which is helpful. So if Jane includes 1,500 of scholarship and in income, Jane will be deemed to have applied $1,500 of scholarship to pay living expenses and 4,000 to pay qualified education expenses. The qualified education expenses would be 2,000 and the AGI and modified AGI would be 22,900. The tax liability before any credits would be uh, 211. And so let's stop it there. Note, so whether you will benefit from applying a scholarship or fellowship grant to non-qualified expenses will depend on the amount of the student's qualified education expenses, the amount of the scholarship or fellowship grant, and whether the scholarship or fellowship grant may, by its terms, be used for non-qualified expenses. Any benefit will also depend on the student's federal and state marginal tax rates, as well as any federal and state tax credits and student claims. Before deciding, 
look at the local amount of your federal state tax ref refunds or taxes owed. And if the student is your dependent, the student tax refund or tax owed. For example, if you are the student and you also claim the earned income credit, choosing to apply a scholarship or fellowship grant to non-qualified expenses may in uh, including the amount of your income may benefit you if the increase to the American Opportunity Credit is more than the decrease to the earned income credit. So expenses that don't qualify. Qualified education expenses don't include amounts paid for uh, insurance, medical expenses, including student health fees, room and board, transportation, or similar personal living or family expenses. So this is true even if the amount must be paid to the institution as a condition of enrollment or attendance. Sports, games, hobbies, non-credit courses. So qualified education expenses generally don't include expenses that relate to any course or of uh, instruction or other education that involves sports, hobbies, uh, or, or uh, any non-credit course. So my bowling class, you're not going to accept my bowling class. I don't really count it as a sport, really. I guess you could say it's a hobby, a sport, I guess. It, however, if the course of instruction or other education is part of the student's uh, degree program, these expenses can qualify. Comprehensive or bundle fees. So some eligible educational institutions combine all their fees for an academic period into one amount. So if you don't receive or don't have access to an allocation showing how much you paid for qualified education expenses and how much you paid for personal expenses such as those listed earlier, contact the institution. So some institutions, and again, this is where the government making all these rules actually kind of messes up how different business structures would work because sometimes it might make sense to have an institution include all these things as a bundle package, but then they need to break all that stuff out so that they can comply with all these weird tax regulations related to the deductibility of the taxes, which really puts a hamstring on on making the best educational scenario based on you know different formats that might work in different situations. So the institution is generally required to make this allocation and provide you with the amount you paid for qualified education expenses on Form 1098-T. See figure in the credit later for more information about Form 1098-T.